this is sandwich between two sort of heavy talks and this will be rather light talk and i promise you that there'll not be any p values or complex to decode graphs or anything of that sort so my topic will be reopening diabetes clinic after lockdown so what are the things we need to keep in mind when we reopen diabetes clinic after lockdown so at the outset i want to give two disclaimers number one anything at all you need you hear about coronavirus or coronavirus related research is a work in progress it's not set in stone what i say today might change in the near future when more and more data accumulate but by and large we will be taking a first principles approach that is the principles that are eternal and that do not change the data might come and go they may change a bit but the principles don't so this talk would have a first principles approach but by and large anything to do with coronavirus is a work in progress number 2 this is the motto of royal society nullius in verba it means we don't take any man's word at face value we double check it we look at the evidence you might have been aware of the lancet study that was recently published which got into a lot of heat because the data then didn't, didn't seem real so at this point this disease itself is hardly about 6 months old if it were a baby born in january now it would be just turning in its cradle it's as young as that corresponding to that we have a huge number of papers that have been published and many of them are of subpar quality so you need to keep your eyes and ears open and not just fall prey to any paper that is published in the literature so these two disclaimers will set the stage for today's talk so when we talk about reopening diabetes clinic post covid 19 there are two important principles that i want you to remember number one is the safety of care safety for the doctor safety for the patient safety for the other healthcare workers and so on secondly is the continuity of care so these two are the core principles that we need to take care in order to successfully run a diabetes clinic in the post covid 19 phase so we'll be talking about safety first so this part of the talk will reinforce what you have probably heard from a zillion different sources either government or non government in tvs newspapers phones podcasts videos so on and so forth nevertheless it becomes important to reiterate what we already know and to post uh, information education communication um, posters in our clinics the first and foremost of which is the one for which we have the highest evidence that is social distancing so social distancing becomes extremely important and the patients need to be reminded of it ad nauseum until they get the importance of social distancing so even if one patient gets uh, infected with social distancing we can greatly reduce the chances that the second person will get infected which is why it becomes the first and foremost thing we will consider in opening the clinic so it's not enough to tell that social distancing is important or to put up posters to that effect we need also specific actionable information so that means telling the patients that how much distance should be kept between uh, two patients when they seat uh, when they are seated in the waiting room and so on now at this point it might look impractical especially in smaller places to have a 6 feet difference in such case we can have a 3 feet difference or you can optimize the patient inflow by giving less number of registrations at any given moment so it it is basically optimizing for two things at the same time one is the space that is available number two is the time that is available for any given patient at any given time so when we optimize on these two parameters we can greatly improve the social distancing in our clinics so now that we know that social distancing is important the patient is coming to the hospital and he is sitting in the uh, distance place he must also be uh, told that it's not okay to touch anything and everything in the hospital because for all practical purposes the hospital must be considered an infective place and therefore uh, the patient should be told that they should touch only what they need 
and if they touch what they need they must also have a clear idea as to how to wash their hands how long to wash their hands these are commonly available information in you i mean just a simple googling will tell you all of this information that sometimes people don't wash their hands or don't use the appropriate technique or don't wash their hands for long enough all of these have been shown to be uh, contributory to spread of coronavirus so it is important that we have posters and uh, reminders to all of this information in our clinics they are very easy to make you just hit the uh, control p and print the uh, poster and paste it there in the clinic so the patient must realize that there are three portals of entry of the corona virus into the human body number 1 is the eye number 2 is the mouth and number 3 is the nose so our strategies for prevention of corona virus infections in a diabetic clinic as in anywhere else is about protecting these portals of entry these are the routes by which a virus is going to enter the body and we are going to protect these routes by various methods and the most common method that we use is to wear a mask and unfortunately we see that a lot of patients do not have the right technique in wearing the mask and wearing a mask under the nose is like wearing uh, a, an underwear like this it doesn't serve any purpose this is not the only mistake that patients do there are many other kinds of mistakes they make and for example as you see here this slide shows five different types of mistakes in wearing a mask number 1 is the uh, guy who wears it below the nose number 2 is a person who leaves his chin unprotected number 3 is a woman who is wearing a mask that is too loose number 5 4 is a guy who wears Uh, a mask that just covers the tip of the nose and number 5 is the uh, is the obvious error now why these five pictures are put is that except the uh, number 5 almost all of these four can easily get missed in a diabetic clinic if a patient wears masks in inappropriate manner it can easily get missed therefore the support staff must be trained to instruct patients on the correct method of mask wearing or you can put up posters or uh, pictures or even videos if, if you have access to a tv in the waiting room so that the people who are sitting there are not just wearing a mask but wearing it correctly because a mask that is not worn correctly is not of much use and the last thing uh, in with regard to patient education material is this is probably uh, optional you might if you want you can put up a uh, qr code or something of that sort to uh, tell patients about the government supported app called aurogya setu which is available in the app store and play store which they can download into their uh, mobile phones now whether these apps are of real value to the end user is is probably questionable but they are of great value to the uh, epidemiologists and the uh, surveillance teams so to summarize the patient education in a diabetic clinic must focus on all of these things number 1 social distancing number 2 portals of entry of the virus number 3 hygiene which includes hand hygiene and all the steps that are involved in it number 4 masks and the correct technique of wearing the mask and number 5 is which is optional is uh, is the aurogy setu app so now that we have educated the patients by means of either iec material or by videos or by posters we need to look at what are the areas of infection control in a diabetic clinic this can be either the opd itself or or something other than the opd whichever place we are looking at trying to prevent infection all these places will have similar requirements in terms of supplies so these are the four major kinds of supplies that we are interested in number one is the hand sanitizer or some kind of uh, equipment to sanitize the hand number two is the ppe or personal protective equipment which includes the gloves the mask the eye gear the head gear the whole body gear as well as the footwear number three is the uh, is the cleaning material either it is lysol or detergent or sodium hypochlorite or anything of that sort and number four is the temperature checking uh, infrared thermometer 
Now, to be honest, in Ramchandra, we use these infrared thermometers, but uh, they rather serve a placebo purpose, in my personal opinion. Most of the patients who uh, who spread the virus are relatively asymptomatic. In fact, the virus has an 80% uh, asymptomatic rate, according to the latest ICMR paper. So therefore, this IR uh, thermometer is unlikely to pick up any cases. At the same time, if a patient, it is very rare that a patient does not know that he has a fever and comes to the hospital and an IR thermometer picks it up. But it's still a nice add-on to have. But the other three or uh, uh, can can the others please uh, mute their uh, mute their computer so it, it becomes easier for us to communicate. Okay, thank you. So there are these three or rather must. This is an optional add-on. So when it comes to detergent, you you could do use anything that is available to you. These are there are well published methods as to how to prepare a 1% hypochlorite solution, which is the cheapest way to disinfect. What is important to know is that when you're sitting in a clinic and somebody cleans your table or the chair or the surroundings, you need to ensure that it is cleaned uh, under your supervision so that you are absolutely sure that you are keeping your hands on a surface that is completely disinfected. Because uh, you never know if you can completely rely on people who do that. So it's important to know that you should be absolutely sure. So now that we have these supplies in hand, uh, these supplies are available everywhere. We need to see what areas inside the OPDs need some degree of protection. Number one is outside the clinic. Number two is patient registration. Number three is the waiting area. And number four is the doctor's chamber itself. So outside the clinic, uh, what are some steps we can take? Patients traveling in their own vehicle can wait in the car until they receive a, a mobile communication that their turn is there and they can come inside the clinic. Caregivers have to wait outside the clinic and unless it is absolutely necessary for them to come because we need we don't want to have any crowd in the clinic. We want to have the caregivers to be waiting outside the clinic. So the outside the clinic is an area where people wait in, the, in their own vehicles or in their car and the caregivers wait outside. You can also customize the outside of the clinic to have a hand washing area. So this is a, a friend's clinic in uh, Trivandrum where uh, they have put up a hand washing solution there, as you can see here. So the cars get parked here, they wash their hands here, and then they go and wait in their cars. So they get a WhatsApp message saying that their turn is ready, and then they go and meet the doctor. So this prevents any overcrowding and any sort of confusion or crowding in the waiting area. So once the patient enters the cleaning, he goes for a registration. And in the registration counter, appointment management system is absolutely critical because we need to ensure that in a given time slot, only a few patients are there and their timing, the patient knows, the support staff knows, and the doctor knows. Number of patients and how much time we spend per patient needs to be restricted so that we reduce the risk to ourselves and to the patient. It is very, very important that we tell the patient that we do this not as a way of protecting ourselves alone, but also to protect them and the community at last. It's in everybody's best interest to have some degree of discipline there. So PPE must be provided to the staff who are working there. If there are more than two support staff, you can ask them to come on alternate days so that we reduce their risk of exposure. Questionnaire can be given to the patients so they can fill it up and uh, uh, drop it in the uh, uh, in the registration area. This questionnaire includes questions about travel, questions about uh, fever, respiratory complaints, and so on and so forth. It can be as simple as you want or as complex as you want, but it is important to have a questionnaire. And that questionnaire must also collect details of all patients, including address, in the rare event that we may later need to contact trace those patients who turn positive. So masks and sanitizers must be available in the patient registration area so that the patient can be billed for it and provided that. There is no role for using cloth masks or scarves or any other sort of extra clothing that increases the chance of transmission. So it is ideal that you discourage the use of cloth masks inside the clinic. A three-play mask to the patient would be a, a good way to ensure that we have a reasonable protection. So this is the sort of uh, 
you know, questionnaire that we have in our hospital. We ask for fever, cough, breathlessness. And it, it's a very simple thing. It hardly takes 30 seconds to do that. And it gives the patient uh, some degree of confidence that things are going fine. And we collect the uh, contact details from the EMR itself. If you don't have an EMR, you can have a paper questionnaire, which takes the, that kind of information. And then the patient goes on to pay. Uh, we preferably use online payment so that, and that is a zero contact online payment so that uh, we reduce the risk of transmission again in that zone. We'll talk more about it in some coming slides, but just remember that we prefer this. So waiting area is the next zone, patient outside the clinic, then registration, the waiting area. In the waiting area, chairs must be placed uh, separate, uh, separately and patients should be given their own space. If you have a seating arrangement like this where the chairs cannot be separated, you can uh, put a paper with a cross mark on the chairs, which should not be sat on. So they can use their you know, luggage or something of that sort, some bags that they have brought to be kept on these chairs but the patient should be seated two chairs apart. So that's how we uh, reduce the risk of transmission in the waiting area. One important role the waiting area plays is that the patient is anyway waiting. We have some access to the patient's attention there. Most of these patients are relatively scared either about their diabetes or about their risk of getting COVID infection. So some kind of counseling through videos, if you have uh, some TV or some kind of audiovisual equipment there, that would be a good, place to play those videos uh, that will, you know, sort of in a week or mild attempt to cheer up the patients and tell them the right kind of information. Because as we all know, with today's infodemic, lots of bad information is circulating in social media and other areas. So we need to give the appropriate authentic information to the patients in the waiting area. Then the patient comes to the doctor's chamber. There are a variety of things that you can do in a doctor's chamber. For instance, outdoor OPDs can cut the risk by 18 times, but as you might know, this is, uh, this is in many cases impractical. This is one of my friends in UP. He's, uh, he, he has put up some kind of uh, makeshift outside OPD because the outdoor risk of transmission is dramatically lower when compared to indoor transmission of indoor sustained contact. This is again one of my friends in Delhi who has some kind of green uh, social distancing where he keeps some plants in the clinic to ensure that the patient is seated at least uh, one and a half meters to two meters apart. I mean, what these are uh, different ways of doing social distancing. They, you can get as creative as you want. Whatever you works for you, you, you need to do. That's all. Apart after each patient practice hand hygiene, change gloves after seeing each patient. PPE, each component of the PPE is important. I'll show you later why. And then only minimum timing and touch per patient. Do not auscultate from the front. If possible, don't carry a stethoscope. If you're a diabetologist or an endocrinologist, you don't need to carry a stethoscope for most cases. And don't auscultate from the front if you're doing. Ask the patient not to cough. This is specific, explicit advice not to cough. Some people may, you know, in spite of all our methods of education, uh, and, until you tell that when they walk into the chamber, they may not really comply with that. The, the pa neither the patient nor the doctor should be wearing any watch, ornaments, or any kind of accessories. So this is a latest paper published in Lancet. Physical distancing is the one for which we have the maximum evidence. So less than one meter distancing is quite risky. One meter or more distancing reduces the chance by about uh, by a large margin. We, cuts down the chan, uh, chance four times. Similarly with face masks, what I want you to focus on is the last half, the eye protection. A lot of us forego eye protection. Either we don't wear goggles or the face masks. The uh, eye protection is about as important as the face masks. As you can see, without eye protection, the risk of transmission is about 16%. Without mask, that is 17%. So it's almost as important as wearing a mask. But few doctors do not do that. Only very few doctors uh, protect their eyes. In fact, in the latest ICMR healthcare workers paper, one, a whopping 18% of healthcare providers did not wear any kind of PPE when caring for the patients, which is a frankly ridiculous thing. So we need to understand that nothing is 100% protective, but cumulatively, each one of these contribute to our protective effect. So this slide summarizes whatever I have told about every 
part of our diabetes clinic the patient registration uh, the outside the clinic the patient registration area doctor's chamber waiting area and so on so you need to think about your setup and then customize it to your setup to think what is possible in your setup and what you can do so there is not going to be a universal guideline for this because it's simply impossible each setup varies in its own uh, resources and so on and so forth so you need to customize okay. it okay okay ipo naam pesna na eppadi chesadu Uh, should i test uh, these are a couple of commonly asked questions should i test patients without symptoms no you don't need to test patients without symptoms should i prescribe hydroxychloroquine to diabetes patients as a way to protect them from covid in my diabetes clinic now whenever we look at any intervention we look at four things number one the benefits of the intervention number four number two the risk then the alternatives and what happens if you don't treat so the benefits of taking hcq have been shown if you take more than six doses there are some minor side effects with hcq there are no proven alternatives as of now and no treatment uh, we do not know exactly what happens in infection in the non hcq ah abidan so this is the uh, sort of thing that we are interested in so there is no right answer to this question depending on the risk uh, profile of the patient you may or may not choose to give hydroxychloroquine there is no right or wrong answer to this question so the first part of the presentation we looked at the safety ensuring the safety of the patient and the uh, service providers at different stages of their registration and different uh, locations in the diabetes clinic whether to give them uh, hydroxychloroquine whether to you know test these patients for covid 19 and so on and so forth i am not specifically to uh, talking about the diabetes management and covid management into in total so for example a patient of diabetes coming with covid or a covid patient with diabetes so that is really dealt by another speaker the second part of the talk will be about how do we ensure continuity of care now that there is a disruption of care and... there is some audio issue uh... okay uh, are you able to hear me now hello yes sir, it's better i think some internet uh, connectivity issue uh, but we can hear you now Okay, fine. Thank you. Yeah, let, so, can you be a little closer to the mic, sir? So it will be better. Okay. So perfect. We 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 have a, a disruption of services everywhere. Patients are uh, uh, getting annoyed because the services are getting disrupted. So telemedicine is the is the inevitable way to go in the time of a pandemic because that's the safest way to contact a patient and ensure continuity of care. telemedicine is for all practical purposes here to stay at least till the pandemic is completely over or most of us get immune or uh, uh, a vaccine is developed telemedicine doesn't need to be completely high fi or so so you know as the slide shows you, it's it's a whole typewriter telemedicine is basically giving the same kind of care through a remote mechanism it's just an enabler it is it does not need to be high fi doesn't need to be high tech whatever tools that you are normally using to uh, talk with friends and family and relatives can be used for telemedicine the first thing is to let your patients know that you are available through telemedicine if your clinic is li listed in uh, google maps you can uh, edit the location information to show that at what time you are available in your clinic and what kind of pre registration need to be done and appointment need to be taken and you can also do tele triage when a patient registers new patients can be given uh, priority in the uh, face to face consultation whereas old patients can most likely benefit from telemedicine consultation so when a patient chooses for telemedicine uh, you need to tell them some tips about telemedicine lot of patients are not computer literate so there can be audio issues there can be bandwidth issues so the video doesn't play well and so on and so forth they don't know how to upload the documents and you know use the payment gateway and all all that you can uh, this is my blog if i have given some temp tips for telemedicine you you can go through what are the tips and how you can basically communicate to the patient so this will be the broad workflow of telemedicine once this is the workflow that is approved by the medical council of india on march 25th 2020 there has to be a patient identification step because anonymous telemedicine is illegal in india we cannot do anonymous telemedicine so the patient has to be identified 
consent if the patient calls you himself then that consent is implied otherwise you have to take uh, explicit consent even otherwise taking explicit consent is a is a good habit i suppose then we choose assessment assessment does not only mean clinical assessment but also assessment as to whether that patient is a right candidate for telemedicine so in telemedicine we give three things education counseling and prescription of drugs so there are some legal things that we need to understand first consult should always only be a video consult according to mca first consult means this is the first time you see the patient or you see the you the patient is your regular patient but the last time you saw him was more than 6 months back or he, the patient is your regular patient but he has come with the new complaint for example uh, day before yesterday i saw a, a diabetes patient he has lost some weight then i asked him to check uh, thyroid levels and he is coming with hyperthyroidism so that kind of patient uh, becomes a first consult he is a non diabetic patient he didn't lose weight because of diabetes but because of new onset hyperthyroidism so that becomes a first consult and therefore it cannot be a uh, text or audio consult there can be no anonymous consultation all consultations must receive an invoice if a patient contacts you consent is implied prescription of medicine requires video consultation whereas counseling and health education does not require video consultation you can do it by audio or any other means record keeping there are no new guidelines but as per the it act of 2000 uh, amendments in 2011 for non mlc cases it should be 3 years and for mlc cases it's about 10 uh, years so there are something called e prescriptions and e signatures uh, they are complicated things but what you need to remember is the simplest way is to write a prescription in hard copy take a photo and email to the patient this keeps the digital trail intact secondly e signatures uh, and e prescriptions are not mandatory but they provide two important things that routinely taking a, a photo of your sign and then pasting it in every document does not provide number one is that it provides authentication by a public private key pair number two it gives the chance of repudiation non repudiation that means uh, when some somebody has an e signature it means that you have to authorize it you cannot later go on and say uh, somebody else did for me so that is what e signatures do but they are not mandatory as of now for telemedicine if you are interested you can check out uh, cc and e mudra these are government programs central government programs uh, that give out e signatures so the next thing is that i told you before that all patients require an invoice if you are doing a whatsapp consultation you may not have the necessary system for giving an invoice when you are sitting at home this razer pay and instamo jo or free payment gateways that that take care of this invoicing problem they are also free and relatively easy to use so you might want to try them out there are other tools for example one thing that you can easily do is to shift from your uh, regular whatsapp to the business whatsapp which is free to use and uh, it you could ideally use a separate phone so that you have a physical separation of the normal phone and the clinic phone if not you can use uh, parallels or a second space or any such app to have two whatsapps with two uh, sim cards in the same phone so these are some basic tips about telemedicine they are not the be all and end all of medicine but i just wanted to touch on it because it is very important to uh, know about something about telemedicine before we uh, reopen our clinics in the post covid era to summarize there are two important things that we need to understand one is the safety of ourselves our patients and the community at large and the continuity of care that we need to provide to every diabetes patient and this requires uh, a nice mix of both technology as well as human values it cannot be done just by technology or just by human values it, it requires a rich blend of both of these things and if we stick to the basic principles i am pretty sure we will be able to handle this quite well so thank you for listening it's been lovely talking to you